No part of this lecture may be used without the express written consent of Rick Ramos or Contra Costa College. Hi, this is Professor Rick Ramos, and this is a lecture series on legal aspects of evidence. We're in lecture number three, part one. Well, the topic we're going to cover, which coincides with chapter three in your book, is witness testimony. To get a better understanding of this um, concept of testimony, let's define it. Testimony is a sworn statement in court from a witness who has some personal knowledge of the facts being tried in the case. Witnesses can also authenticate and explain writings or material objects. In other words, they can basically say that they created them or they know how they were created, etc. Now, when we look at the idea of testimony, the Sixth Amendment gives certain guarantees. Number one, the right to confront witnesses, which means that, that if someone accuses us of something, we have the right to cross-examine them on the stand. And what that means is that we can um, have an opportunity to test, clarify, or impeach, which means to see if they're lying, witness testimony. This is part of the Sixth Amendment <clears throat> and is also referred to as the Confrontational Clause. Examples could include, in personal examination and cross-examination of the witness, the accused has the opportunity not only of testing the recollection and sifting the conscience of the witness, but of compelling him to stand face to face with the jury in order that they may look at him or her, judge their demeanor upon the stand, the manner in which they give testimony, and whether they're uh, worthy of belief. In other words, it gives an opportunity for the trier of fact to examine the person, because remember, it's truth beyond uh, or proof beyond a reasonable doubt. They may not believe the testimony of the witness, and it's important that they have an opportunity to to look at the, that that witness uh, and with some scrutiny over the testimony. The other thing, the other part of the Sixth Amendment guarantee is a compulsory testimony. Um, if you have a situation where the suspect has an alibi, in other words, somebody has seen the uh, suspect in another place at, at this exact time that the crime occurred, but they don't personally like the, the suspect. A perfect example would be I had a case in Berkeley where a woman allegedly had been watching a young man wash his car at the exact time that a robbery took place. And so she uh, basically had some knowledge that would alibi him in his case, and she didn't like him, so she didn't want to be involved. And the defense found in my, it, I had a statement from her where she said that, yes, she had seen him, but she didn't want to go into depth with me. And they basically subpoenaed, put her on the stand, and it, and it showed that the young man had not um, committed the crime. So it was very important that he had the ability to force someone to testify uh, so that the truth be known. We know that today with, with the sophisticated prison gangs and street gangs that one of their methods of operation is to eliminate witness testimony when they can to prevent them from being prosecuted. And unfortunately, the Sixth Amendment demands that people who are going to testify are able to, to um, be confronted by the, the defendant in the case, even when the risk of retaliation to a witness is sufficiently grave. Uh, there's a couple cases to talk about here. One is where inmates in Los Angeles County Jail would be hunted down and killed by the Mexican Mafia prison gang if their identities became known. Um, they were testifying in a government case. The government, government may not permanently withhold the identity of a witness from the defense, and witness may not testify anonymously at trial. They have to identify themselves and say who they are. To do otherwise would undermine the defense right to confront his accuser. There's no mortal danger exception to the Sixth Amendment which seals a witness testimony. In other words, no matter how dangerous it is, the person still would have to testify in court. It is permissible for a judge, however, to withhold in jeopardy witness names until the trial actually starts so that they can't be executed or, or eliminated beforehand or, or um, scared so they don't testify or to disclose the information only to defense counsel, not directly to the defendants. And that comes from Alvarado case in OO and also the Lopez case also in, in the year 2000. In another gang-related murder trial, the prosecution sought to have the defendants removed to another room while witnesses testified and have voice altered witness testimony via telephone. This was because of potential danger to witnesses and their families. 
because they had been threatened by the gang, basically, if you testify against, against us, you'll die. Though there is a societal need to protect witnesses, the Sixth Amendment mandates the right to identify and personally confront witnesses in court. And this was at People versus Wheaton and Young in uh, 1995. Particular attention has been paid to sex crime cases, and uh, there's been some changes made, not necessarily toward the benefit of the of the victim in these cases. The U.S. invalidated an Iowa law, which allowed the placement of a screen around the defendant while victims of sexual abuse testified. This tactic denied the defendant his Sixth Amendment rights to be confronted with witnesses against him. It's difficult to imagine a more obvious damaging violation of a defendant's right to face-to-face -face confrontation. This is Coy versus Iowa in 1988. In 2003, the use of one-way glass to shield an adult sexual assault victim from viewing the defendant, because the victim was suffering from hyperventilation anytime she saw the defendant, violated the defendant's right to confrontation. In 1990, the use of closed-circuit television to shield child witnesses from the trauma of direct testimony didn't violate the Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause. There's still visual examination between the child witness and the defendant. So therefore, um, closed-circuit TV is allowed. In 1996, trial court's decision to allow a shooting victim to testify by making gestures of yes and no responses to questions didn't violate the Sixth Amendment. The victim had been shot with a shot off, sawed off shotgun during a fight and was in a coma for 18 months. The only way that he could communicate was by tapping a pencil once for yes and twice for no. The District Court of Appeals ruled that although the victim had testimonial limitations, there was meaning, meaningful opportunity for cross-examination. Both the prosecution and defense faced the same questioning limitations, and this is People v. Tran in 1996. So how do we get somebody to show up in court to testify? We use a subpoena. A subpoena is a written order commanding the presence of a witness in a court for the purpose of giving testimony. The following persons are legally authorized to issue subpoenas in the California Penal Code Section 1326. They include a judge or magistrate, a court clerk, a district attorney or district attorney investigator, a public defender or public defender investigator, or attorney of record for the defendant. It is a misdemeanor to not respond to a subpoena and show up in court. Once we get the witness into the courtroom, we swear them in under penalty of perjury, and this establishes a felony violation for normally and intentionally giving false testimony about a material fact while under oath. And that's perjury, PC 118 to 129. Also, you might note that the, the contempt of court section is a misdemeanor violation 166, excuse me, 1209 to 122 of the Code of Civil Procedures. And also violation of a court order is PC 166.4 and 166.6. Witness examination process. The witness examination process has four steps. First is direct examination. This is listed under 760 of the evidence code. And it is the initial examination by the side calling the witness. A witness can be questioned about any fact relevant to the case. The next step is cross examination. You can find this under 761 of the evidence code. This is rebuttal questioning by the opposing counsel for the purpose of testing, clarifying, or impeachment of a witness. A witness may be cross-examined about any matter brought out during direct examination, and that is found in 773 of the Evidence Code. Next is redirect examination. This can be found in 762 of the Evidence Code. It is requesting by the side who called the witness for the purpose of clarification or rehabilitation. So if we bring someone up and they talk about uh, something that they saw, and in cross-examination, the counsel is able to uh, discredit them, in redirect, the original counsel that called them has an opportunity to clarify their um, testimony, and that's called rehabilitation of their testimony. They rehabilitate the testimony so that the jury will give more credit to it. The last step is recross-examination. And this is 763 of the evidence code. It is requestioning of a witness by opposing counsel, the cross examiner, for the purposes of clarification or impeachment. 
The magistrate is charged with the responsibility to control the mode of the examination for effective ascertainment of the truth and protect the witness from undue harassment or embarrassment. When a child under the age of 14 is called as a witness, the court may take special care to protect the minor and ensure questions are stated in a matter that the child will understand. As a general rule, leading questions may not be asked of a witness during direct or redirect examination, but as permitted on cross-re-examination or with a hostile witness. So that means that I can't lead you down the road. You know, did you go to uh, 6th and Maple that day on, on the 26th of May? I have to say, where were you on the 26th of May? And you have to identify you were at 6th and Maple. The only other interesting... Uh, Rule is under 868.5 PC. A victim testifying in a violent or sex crime case is entitled to have a support person accompany them to the witness stand. There is a compelling state interest to minimize the psychological trauma to such a, vic uh, a person um, who's testifying. A quick review of other related topics. Again, we talked about contempt of court, and that's a court sanction. It could be misdemeanor or civil, where a person can be imprisoned or fined when a witness fails to respond to a subpoena, or refuses to be sworn as a witness, or refuses to answer material questions, or violates a court order. Next is perjury, which we know is a felony for knowingly giving false testimony in court. It's also a felony for an officer to intentionally make false statements in a police report. Certain individuals who have certain relationships have statutory privileges in the evidence code where a witness can legally refuse to testify in court. They include husband and wife, attorney and client, clergy and confessor, or official information privilege, and we'll talk more about this in Chapter 9. A witness cannot be held in contempt of, for, in contempt of court for claiming such a privilege. The next topic is on the kinds of witnesses. There are two types of witnesses in California. There's the lay witness and the expert witness. A lay witness is an ordinary citizen and most police officers who have some personal knowledge of the facts being tried in a criminal case. This can be found under 702 of the EC. That's the evidence code. A lay witness doesn't possess special skills or knowledge in a relevant field. They can testify about what they saw, heard, or perceived through senses, but they cannot give um, opinions or conclusions. There is an exception when they can give opinions, and this is called the opi opinion evidence rule, and we'll speak about that in a moment. So again, the general rule is a lay witness can only testify to facts within one's personal knowledge. They can express an opinion or conclusion in conjunction with one's testimony, except with the exception, which is called the opinion evidence rule. Most police officers, by the way, testify their entire careers as lay witnesses. The second type of witness is an expert witness. An expert witness possesses some special knowledge, skill, expertise, training, or education that is relevant to the facts being tried in the case. This can be found under 720 of the EC. An expert witness is permitted to give an opinion or conclusion in conjunction with one's testimony. The opinion can be based upon the actual physical examination of some aspect of the evidence, Presenting the expert with facts relevant to the case from which they can draw an opinion through knowledge, expertise, or training. A hypothetical, it could be a what if this happened, how would you uh, uh, interpret it. Or an expert witness can be appointed by the court to render a report on the issues under consideration and give relevant testimony. Before a person can be considered an expert witness, they... They have to be examined, and this examination is called a voir dire. The voir dire involves direct examination conducted by counsel who desires to present the expert witness and cross-examination by the opposing counsel. Ordinarily, the witness would testify to their education, schools, degrees, certificates, trainings, trade schools, experience, which would include number of years of work or research, books, uh, studies written, or anything else that would satisfy the court that they're an expert in the area. The voir dire must be conducted with each expert unless both sides stipulate that the witness is an expert. There are no set rules in determining how much training, education, experience a person needs to possess in order to become an expert witness. The burden of proof is on the proponent to establish qualifications of the expert. 
The ultimate inquiry is whether the subject matter is beyond the common knowledge and experience of a layman and the testimony will assist the trier of fact in evaluating the evidence. The magistrate always has the final decision whether or not they're going to accept the testimony of this person. It's up to the trier of fact to determine what credibility and weight is given to the opinion in the determination of the, of the facts of the case. In other words, duly qualified experts may give their opinions on questions and controversy at trial to assist the jury in deciding such questions. The jury may consider the opinion with the reasons stated there, therefore, if any, by the expert who gives the opinion. The jury is not bound to accept the opinion of any expert as conclusive. In other words, they can listen to it and say, this is BS, we don't want to believe this, or we don't believe this is true. They may have some other knowledge or something else that comes in in court that, that makes them believe it's, that the information is not ap absolutely accurate. But they should give weight to it, and, and it should help to clarify some of the situations that they're having to look at. The jury may, however, disregard such opinion if it shall be found by them to be unreasonable. This is the end of Lecture 3, Part 1 on Witnesses. And in Part 2, we're going to start off by talking about the opinion evidence rule for the lay witnesses. And then we'll start looking at different things that we would uh, allow lay witnesses to talk about and finish up this lecture. Make sure that you're reviewing the study questions at the end of each chapter and that you're keeping up with the workbook assignments as they are detailed in the online instructions for this class. Thank you, and that's the end of this lecture.